Okay, welcome to this discussion about classification modeling. So this is tied to the Data 728 course with Davenport, although um, it could be of use to other folks. So I wanna go ahead and post it out here as well on my YouTube channel. Um, but what I'm gonna walk you through is basically the three week assignments that we go through related to classification uh, modeling. Talk a little bit about what we're calling classification modeling within the context of this course. And this course is again um, based off of a CRM type of a context. So uh, a lot of the things which we'll talk about will be related to CRM use cases. Now I won't go too far deep into the models because there is some assignment material here, but it'll give you an idea of what the individual pieces are and how they all um, collect with each other. So first of all, again, we have talked about this. We're gonna start with the uh, cross-platform, cross-industry process for data mining, the CRISP DM uh, platform is really what we use. Um, of the three weeks, the first week which we're gonna talk about here, it's gonna be focused on the first three phases of that. So business understanding, data understanding, data preparation. In the following week, we're gonna talk about modeling and evaluation, and then finally finishing up on the third week of deployment. This is week two of the course for those of you who are following along. The business objectives really for this particular block is to define the business objective, um, to define that modeling approach which we're going to use and design a modeling process that'll go along with that approach. Uh, we may have additional data that we want to include inside of our model. And so there'll be some, if you have additional files, you wanna also provide that whenever we're evaluating this. Um, continuing to investigate the data sources which you're going to use, uh, select which of those to use, and then perform some basic exploration of your data, do the validation, the cleaning, the enrichment on it, and then provide some guidance on what you would do as far as the validation. So this is really addressing the first three phases, the business understanding, the data understanding, and the data preparation phase. Now, again, the two sides of this are the classification and behavioral segmentation modeling. So using the textbook definition of them, um, you know, one is classification is about trying to attempt to draw some conclusions based on observed value. So it's trying to predict a value. Typically takes the form of either a supervised or an unsupervised. So a supervised is using training data that is used as an input to a classification algorithm that's compared against a known outcome. For example, if we're classifying email as spam or not spam based off of previous examples. So unsupervised, that's more commonly called clustering or it's seen as clustering. There's other techniques that could be um, unsupervised techniques, but clustering is the one which we'll use in this course. So this looks for anomalies or outliers as part of it. Now behavioral segmentation, um, that's the attempt to try to divide a heterogeneous market into a relatively more homogeneous segment based off of certain parameters like geographical location, demographics, etc. Um, it really, the purpose of that is to really minimize the risk by determining which products have the best chances of gaining a target market share. Again, within the context of a CRM type of a, a situation. The value is it allows you to reach a particular customer segment more effectively, and it can also help you in retaining customers, and there's several objectives which you can get out of it. So within the context of Data 728, um, we're calling classification as a heavier focus on the supervised modeling pieces of it. Uh, we'll get into some things like bagging and boosting. Um, may also discuss a little bit about bootstrapping too later in the course. Uh, the models which you typically have in this will be decision trees, shade, Bayesian models, uh, support vector machines, for example. Under behavioral segmentation, that's gonna be a more heavier focus in this course on the unsupervised modeling pieces of it. So that's gonna talk about the clustering evaluation and optimization, and the typical models and the two models which we'll explore in detail are the K-means and the two-step. So that kind of gives you the context of Data 728 and what we're doing inside of the course. The two files which we're gonna provide, again, it goes along with the book the promotions file and the transaction file. So I wanted to give you the metadata that goes along with both of these two. So first of all, uh, the promotions file, that contains information regarding three promotional campaigns. Customers were sent all three and it was recorded on whether or not they responded back to that promotion. It includes a purchase discount um, as part of that too and the amount that each customer has received as a discount was also recorded. 
So the three key fields here you want to look at, or three sections of fields you want to look at, is the customer ID is your record identifier. The promo response is whether or not they responded, uh, zero being no, one being yes. And the promotion discount fields are the amount that the discount that they received and their purchase and response to the offer. So really to connect the transaction and the promotion file together, the key that you have between the two of those is the customer ID field. If you're talking just the promotions file, the primary key on prom promotions file is the customer ID. Now the transaction file has both the transaction ID and a customer. And obviously because a customer may, may make more than one purchase, there'll be multiple transactions to an individual customer. One or more transactions to a customer. Now the payment method is also recorded as part of that, as well as the timestamp of when the transaction took place and the product code, quantity, and the sales amount that you had for that particular transaction. So very typical of what you'd see inside of a transaction file. Um, so you wanna to try to connect these two together. Again, remember the customer ID is how you connect back to that other file, but the transaction ID plus customer ID is the primary key for this particular file because of that many transactions to one customer relationship. So now we also encourage you to think about other data sets which you could bring into the uh, analysis. And so one example, and this comes from a student example, was using the product code to create some categories that go along with it. Now in this case, this individual also added some unit pricing along with it because he wanted to take it into a, a, a little bit different direction here. So in this case here, if I was going to add this, um, there'd be many product codes out there, but it'll have a product category for each code that's out there and a unit price that goes along with it. So you can decide whether or not you want to have that to be a one-to-many, a many-to-many -many type relationship. But in our particular example here, this product code um, maps back to the product code that's in the transaction file. And so then if you're trying to join these pieces of data together, you're going to have to join the transaction file to the product file and then in turn merge that back and join it to the customer ID on the promotions file. So that's how you would join these disparate pieces of data together. So let's talk about business understanding. So some example questions. First of all, the purpose of this is to establish the understanding of the business problem from the customer perspective. And really some of the example questions which we want to ask is what's the strategic approach? What key customer, who are the key customers? What are the customer's broad objectives as part of this? What's the customer doing around the problem today? What specific needs to improve the current state, fulfill objectives are needed? Um, what model outputs or components would you use to determine a successful deliverable? And what components have been restated back to the customer? If so, what was the response? And really, the output of this that's expected for the course is an analysis document. Now this analysis document you'll continue to build on in future weeks and so you can think of this either as three separate documents that you turn in or a single document that you just continue to add to week over week. The preferred would of course be to add to those week over week. So uh, data understanding again to understand what data sources are available to address that problem. What data sources are available, what sources can be used to map to those output components, uh, what will those data sources be? Uh, how will they be accessed? Uh, what kind of what could be uh, features can be extracted from those data sources? These are questions typically you would ask at this stage. And the output of this now this is where you're going to actually turn in a SPSS stream with the data understanding uh, pieces included with it. I would encourage you to use the project uh, format inside of SPSS. But if you decide to turn it in as just separate streams, just make sure you turn in the individual, all of the individual streams. Those will be indicated by an extension of .str. Now while you're going through this step, you should start thinking about the modeling step too as well. It's a good idea to start thinking about it early on. So kind of think about what kind of KPIs or metrics of success you're going to have. What type of analytical methods are best suited to the task and why? How will you evaluate those methods and why? Um, how are those chosen methods aligned back to the stated project problem objectives? So I want you to start thinking about that as you're going through this particular week as well. Now here's a, a snapshot of the uh, SPSS stream which I've created in order to uh, map back to this. And so you'll see here we're talking about that first piece, that data understanding piece. So we want to understand the transactions, the products file, and the promotions file 
understand some basic statistics that go along with it, shape of that data. Um, and then we're starting to merge these sets together. So very similar to what you saw in the previous slides of how those data connects together. You'll start off with the source files. Uh, we'll go into the uh, understanding phases of it. We'll then do some merges and then the outputs of that. I've added an additional step here to select off the Promo 1, the Promo 2, and the Promo 3, showing you some of the metadata that goes along with that too as well. Now these are analysis nodes that are all connected to those selects here. So at various stages of the process, I can confirm the number of records that I have and make sure that we don't have any invalid cases or any dropouts, etc. So now let's shift over and let's go to SPSS. And so here's your data understanding. Now, um, coming from the source files, these Excel files which were provided, coming from that, we will then in turn go into a couple of super nodes. And so again, we've discussed this in class before, but to create a super node, you simply select the items which you'd like to include. Like if I wanted to include these two merges in a super node, you right click and then you can create super node. Now that super node can be renamed to anything that you like. And it's good practice to um, rename those to something that's more understanding. So here you can kind of see really quick, I have the three understanding phases all broken out in super nodes. And it's easy to see that visually on your stream. You'll understand that's what's happening inside of that, that uh, super node. Also, as you see, I'm quite liberal with the comments. So I want to add comments in at various stages. So I understand just as like a personal note, what's happening at each of those stages and what the results of those were. So at this point here, this analysis node, out of all the information that's in there, we see how many cases and that they were all valid. So these are all good notes to have inside of the stream. Now to drill down on just one of these, for example, um, here's the promotions file, here's the products file, and here's the transaction file. They're all relatively the same. Um, coming in, we'll go into a type node. And for this initial type node, um, I'm going to identify the record ID as just that record ID. Remember for this it's going to be the customer ID. Um, and then we're going to go into an analysis node right here. And so from the analysis node that's going to give you the basic statistics that you're looking for. Now out of that I wanted to do another check so I also manually built something out. And so what I did here was I did a select and from here I'm just selecting on the distinct and so I'm saying okay let's do the distinct of the customer ID and then I'm going to do an aggregate and then we'll jump that into a table. And again because we're doing it this way and we're using a discard only the first record in each group it will pull out anything that's a duplicate. So if we have any duplicates it will show up and when you run this stream itself you'll actually show up that there is no duplicates. Only one record shows per case. So we know that all promotion cases are valid and you don't have any duplicate data that you need to address. This is a very elementary, a simple example of some of the types of checks which you can do in your data. Um, you obviously can expand upon this and are expected to expand upon this as you go through that data understanding phase. So here again is kind of the breakout of what you're seeing inside of each of those individual super nodes. And I'm also showing you the project schedule here. So within the project, um, I've already got my business understanding and that's this basically this PowerPoint, my analysis document. All of that's gonna be stored inside of that folder. Um, you can obviously create more folders or, or different folders inside of your SPSS project. But by keeping it organized in this format, in the tool itself, it'll follow the crisp DM format and so it's very relatively simple for you to come back and say, what, am I, what was I doing inside of data understanding? You can pull that up. Now to create something inside of one of these folders here, all you simply have to do is just right click while you're on top of the folder and then you can add to, add to folder right here and then hunt down the actual stream that you'd like to include or any documents, any additional information you'd like to have in these various pieces. Now as you can see, um, my model is fairly well built out at this point. I've got the business understanding. I've got all of the information about the modeling, the evaluations, and the final deployment stream in here as well. So that shows you the project piece of it. Also, in order to create a project, you can also just go here, and then you go to project, new project, 
or you can save a project to as well. So let's talk a little bit about data preparation. Uh, we've already seen a piece of that on the stream, but uh, using this information from those first two steps, the business understanding and the data understanding, now we're gonna start analyzing that data and prepare it for the, the modeling piece itself. So this is where we're gonna start getting into the profiling of the data. This is where you would do the profiling of the data. Here are some, uh, some things to think about. So some of the basic things which we've covered is looking at some of the fundamental descriptive statistics that go along with that data. Um, that's the basic, the first steps that you would do with this. The goal of that is really to validate that the data is consistent and formatted correctly. And some examples of that would be like distinct counts, percentages, summary statistics, etc. cetera, um, percent of zero, nulls, etc. Some of the more advanced techniques is the next step up. Now that's really to identify some of the deeper numerical and analytical relationships in your data. Um, the goal there is to really validate the data is consistent where needed for advanced data profiling. Some examples there are like looking at the key integrity. So we talked about primary and foreign keys. Um, make sure that the, there's keys present, that the keys are accurate. We don't have any nulls. And so what we saw there just a moment ago, looking for distinct counts, for example, that would be one way that you could check it. Um, understanding the cardinality. So is it one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many type relationships? looking for patterns and frequency distributions. That falls within this category. And then finally, contextual profiling. That's where you're getting into more of the um, each feature and what's the role in that business context. What's the driver uh, that it has on the final analysis? And so again, that's to, the goal of that is to comprehend and contextualize the data, uh, the business rules, and identify data structures going along with it too as well. Examples there where we're looking at data hierarchies uh, and unanticipated business rules, functional dependencies. So in this case here, again, I've just given you some examples using the Titanic data set, um, basically showing you some summary statistics, categorical type variable analysis, field values, and bivariate analysis. Um, so again, this is uh, off the Titanic data set, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that would fall into that area. So now let's talk about the data preparation stage here um, for our project. So we've got the three files that we've discussed here. We'll go through some kind of a type uh, node here to do the inputs. Then from there, we're gonna do that merge and then the secondary merge to pull in the promotion data. So at this point, you've got transactions, products, and promotions all together in one. Now in our particular case, I uh, want to normalize that because I think that'll be easier for us to do the modeling out of it. So to normalize that out, I'm gonna lose, use a log 10 function as well. And I'll show you that in detail here when we switch over to the, um, uh, to, to the SPSS. So here again, going into the type nodes and the type nodes here are just all input fields at this point doing a merge, we're gonna merge on product code first, and then we're gonna merge on customer ID second. So again, this part here we've discussed. I wanna do an analysis node just to do a safety check to make sure that everything looks good. But then let's talk about this log 10. So um, if we look at the unit price and the sales amount, we see large variations inside of that. So um, I really wanna get this down to where I'm using uh, like a log 10 to normalize that down into a smaller group. So to do that, I'm actually using a derive node and the formula, here's the formula which I'm going to use. So I'm gonna pull out the sign for whatever that field is, the incoming field, so such as unit price. And then I'm gonna take that times the log 10 of one plus the absolute value of that. And so by doing this type of a calculation, I'm able to create one and I'm gonna use a suffix on my existing field. So I'm gonna use a new field, a derived field it's going to be called unit price underscore log 10. And under unit, uh, it's going to use that derived formula here. So this is how it calculates that particular formula. You may want to use something similar to that, especially on this data set. But kind of think about this whenever you're doing the final analysis. To try to normalize that data out, it's going to make the analysis much easier to do. It's going to make it a little bit more accurate when you get to tuning of the models for this particular data set.
So now that brings us to week three. Um, so week three, we're going to focus on the modeling and the evaluation pieces of it. So for this, we're asking, to, asking you to build the variance of your stream, uh, explore both the bagging technique and the bootstrapping technique, and then do model evaluation. What you'll turn in is continuing to turn in the analysis document. Preferred if you have that all in the same document, continue to add to it. Again, if you turn it as a separate, that won't take off any points. Any SPSS streams that you build or revise, and any data that's provided beyond. So these will be common deliverables throughout all of the weeks of this course. This is addressing the modeling, the evaluation, and the iteration process. So again, remember from the model, uh, we'll have this iteration where as you get things from your evaluation, you'll get new understanding that'll in turn feed the model. And very often you'll go between things like data modeling and data preparation. You'll go around in, in iterations here, working it out until you get something that finally is good. It passes the evaluation that you take it on to deployment. So you're gonna see that over this uh, week three. And so really the purpose of that is to take that data and create the models out of it, um, asking those same questions which we asked before about the modeling, but also try to think of does your model that you produce really align with those data requirements and the business understanding? Does the model show correlation? Is there value to the model? What's the, what's the uh, uh, accuracy of your model? Uh, what issues do you currently see with your model that have been produced? So these are all things that you want to expand upon inside the analysis document. And what are some of the variants that could be produced off of this? Those variants are gonna be important because you're gonna have the final week of this three week series where you're gonna talk about some of those variants and you're gonna produce the final deployment model. So you'll wanna consider a wide variety of different types of models as you go through this. Again, we'll go into the SPSS uh, piece here in a second, but I wanted to cover some of the other pieces of this, which I'd like you to cover um, as, you, as you're building your, your stream out. So again, we've talked a lot about what's happening down here with the normalization. I won't go into this in detail, but up here in the auto data prep node, I want to go a little bit deeper into that. So um, here, I want you to experiment out with the auto data prep. So this is really relevant for larger data sets, especially when you're using these machine learning techniques, um, having that data prepared for many, many factors. Like let's say this model was using 200, 300 factors as part of it, um, having this auto data prep is gonna save you a lot of headache than if you had to manually build it out using one of these type of routines down here. So I want you to experiment around with it and you can decide whether your particular data, your combination of data makes the most sense. Now I'll tell you with the two files or the three files which I'm using here and this very, very small amount of data, very small number of fields, the auto data prep is not gonna be better for me than just manually normalizing it out um, here but this can really save you a lot of time. I want you to explore that auto data prep. So how do you do the auto data prep? Um, again, just from the SPSS, you drop an auto data prep node out there on your, on your form, on your stream. And then uh, within that, you're gonna see that there's a settings. So right here, uh, you'll use analyze, analyze data first, and that will run through the presets. And then what you'll do is you'll change to analysis. When you change to analysis, it'll give you the results. Um, there are three options which we really wanna look at, the summary, the field information, and the actions that go along with it. And so what is this gonna be telling us? This is gonna tell you, based off of your data, um, all the predictors should be considered. So right here, you see that this is suggesting that all predictors should be considered. The node is providing a transformed version of all these fields. So you can see here from this readout, that there's going to be 13 fields that are valuable and 13 fields that are going to be transformed. And so you'll see the original version and the transformed fields. Now in this particular example, my type node, remember, I didn't filter out the, uh, the customer ID. So the customer ID is being considered inside of this and then they're saying, yeah, it's one of the predictors. Now we know that that's just an ID field, so that would be something that you would want to eliminate. Um, and in this case here, uh, the, the system is saying, yes, you should use it as a predictor, but just understand, just because it's saying this is a good predictor doesn't actually mean that it is. Uh, and then finally, um, anything downstream of the auto node will filter out these original fields. 
So if for some reason you want to use those original fields, you're going to have to retain a copy of those original fields. This will only leave the transformed ones. So that's another key piece of this. Second piece we're going to talk about here, this is the uh, actual fields. When you click on the fields, and then from here you'll select a field and it'll show you the detailed data about that field. It'll show you both the original version and the transformed version. Now understand this, uh, this is a bit of an eye chart to see the graphic that's associated with here, but uh, I've selected sales amount, for example. It's showing here that there is no um, missing values, but it's also showing you some of the deviations. So standard deviation I started out with was 634. After the transformed, it transformed it into a standard deviation of one. So um, this one here, it's good. It doesn't include any missing values, which again, we've determined. Um, original values have a rather large standard deviation. It's also skewed. So this could, uh, you can see that in the graph that you see on the right hand side and also that uh, standard deviation. So setting that to a one is gonna make the analysis of my downstream model much easier for me. Now, again, the caveat being the um, relatively small size of the data, the auto pro, pro prep node is really only for investigation only. It wouldn't make sense in this particular situation. I would do it manually. And I've also given you a link here at the bottom to additional auto um, prep node information. Now this particular example here comes from the cloud product, but with respect to this functionality, it's almost identical. Okay, so uh, the final thing here is um, normalizing the fields. Uh, so again, I walked you through this earlier in our conversation, so I won't spend time on that. And I will touch briefly on the modeling piece of it here. So um, our final model as we're building this out, now we've gone through the data preparation phase. We go into the type phase. Now in this type node here, this is where you'll want to set what are the things that you're going to use for that input. Um, so this is really key that you set this correctly. The partition is where we're going to break off our training and our test partition sizes. And then we're going to go into a feature selection node to try to understand what's going to be the most important features. From that, when we run the stream, it'll produce a golden nugget. And the golden nuggets are going to be important for your final models that you produce because you'll eventually trim off these and just keep your golden nuggets. And then here, I'm gonna go ahead and feed that into a chain uh, node <coughs> to perform some initial models. Uh, in addition, uh, for this week, we're asking a auto classifier node. So here's a promotion re one response. That's what I'm setting in the type node as far as my target. And so that's flowing down here into the auto classifier. The auto classifier is gonna generate many different kinds of models for us and select those that have the best accuracy rate. And here I will note that the C5 achieved the 68% accuracy rate. So it's the one that produced the best accuracy rate for us. Let me show you what this looks like inside of SPSS. So here's my type node. So as you can see, I've set the record ID. I did not set this one correctly. I set the record ID or I would set it to none. And then you would go through and determine which of these that you would want to set as the target. In my particular study, customer uh, promo response one is the actual target that I'm going to try to predict. So by using this, I set that to the target. That's how you would set the type node correctly. My partition in here, I'm going to go ahead and set a training partition size of 10. Now that's large. Uh, typically I would set these to uh, maybe a 10% and you can generate multiple training partitions as well. In this case here, I'm just going to use a default of one training and one testing. Um, in many cases, real world cases, you'd use multiple training sets plus also a validation training set. Now this down here, this seed is very important too as well. So what this does is uh, seeds the random number generator that's used to generate these partitions. So by doing that, it allows you to have a repeatable. So you can run the stream again and again and again. It's going to have that uh, repeatable partition every time you run it. You take this out, it's going to be random every time 
and so your results from time to time won't uh, from from pass to pass will not work correctly that's the partition size so coming out of the partition size you're going to have a training and a testing data set you're going to have a breakout and that's actually going to be a new field that you add to as well and so that's where you see this uh, like this training and testing you're going to see those as values inside of that and the labels will be called training and testing now from that um, we then are going to go into the feature selection node so in the feature selection node here um, when this is run you will see that it'll give you an output of which selections are the most important and that's this uh, golden nugget that's produced here now right here looking at this I see that the predictor value is a 1 meaning perfect predictors so when I see this and I see there's several different fields here there's four different fields out of my data set and they're all perfect predictors that gets your uh, your concern your your warning should be going off in your head that that's a little bit too perfect and in this case it is because small data set and really this model that we've built is overfit to this particular data set so that's something to keep in mind when you see things like this it's too perfect it probably is it warrants you to go and start digging a little deeper into it but then by doing this it's going to say these are the ones that you want to have and then from here you can generate actually generate nodes off of it to produce another node that you can use in turn to feed a model now let's talk a little bit about the auto classifier so within this um, I'm able to choose which models that it, it will build now I'll, for again for us I would just suggest that you use the defaults here which is basically all of them except for the KNN and the SVM um, some cases I may want to un, uh, uncheck or check some of these but when we run the golden nugget for this it produces this output for us and all of this will be in the uh, presentation so you can go back and you can review the results out of it but you know again we can look at what's the uh, um, what's the value so we can look at lift we can look at accuracy there's all kinds of different ways uh, that we can we can examine this and we can see right here if we're, if we're gonna look at it we're gonna say that the highest level of accuracy is with the C5 now a 78 percent accuracy is still low it still has areas in there that can be tuned um, but you can kind of see that out of the three options the three models that it built um, that's the one that's going to be the best for us now in this particular example I built out a promo one response using a chain to see if I could get a little bit better tuning by manually building the model out um, in, in our case here uh, you know it could work it could not work so that's kind of the individual pieces inside of the stream itself let's go back to our presentation so here again and what is this telling us the C5 model has the uh, best and the shade is the worst overall accuracy and lift numbers they're not that great um, and I would consider in this case start considering an ensemble model and, we, and in a, a future piece here we're going to explore that so now you can also click on the um, predictor importance and so by looking at the predictor importance uh, ideal would be as if it's on the right hand side here all the way at a one the predictor importance here is relatively low and so as I'm seeing this I'm saying that it has lower predictive value using this current model and that customer ID is still figuring inside of it so I know that just by visually looking at this I can tell that something is not set up in the model when I actually took this screenshot uh, we talked briefly here when we looked at the stream about the model importance and as you can see it's a little bit too perfect you should dive in deeper and the four pieces which are um, used here category quantity unit right price and sales amount um, these are again you can see using the log 10 version of it so these are the normalized versions of the unit price and the sales amount um, fields uh, there they are seen as predictive value um, to this model so now we're going to talk a little bit about ensembles bagging and boosting um, you can also we can also talk a little bit later about bootstrapping that could be another piece 
that we can bring into this. But for the course for this semester, um, we've reduced it down to just these three pieces when talking about some of these more advanced modeling. So first of all, ensemble models, um, those are used for when weak learners are combined to create a more stronger learner with a better performance. Um, you take multiple models and with multi-classifiers and put that together. And so bagging and boosting are techniques you use inside of Ensemble to create random sampling replacements or surrogate data sets for those. And really the goal of doing Ensemble models is to boost the overall model stability, the predictive value of it. So bagging the first one, every element really has the same probability to show up in the final sa sample. It's a simple weighted average, it's run in parallel, and it's really the best option when trying to address high variance. So what we refer to as overfitting of the data, it's your best option. Boosting, um, all the elements are weighted, so resulting in some showing up more often in that final sample. The weighting is uh, averaged, <coughs> excuse me, sequentially, and the best options are used to reduce the bias. This is what's used to address underfitting in many cases. And I've given you a couple of examples in the presentation too as well to show you, um, you know, uh, some examples and deeper dive into ensemble techniques, bagging and boosting. So how does this look inside of a model? So what you do inside of your model itself, you'll see under the build options section, there'll be the option here of whether to use boosting or use bagging. Now, not all models will have the ability to do bagging and boosting. Um, this right here is a CRT uh, model. Um, so this one here does have that ability. Um, when doing this, it'll create that ensemble model with a sequence of models to get the better prediction. And it will increase the time to build. So the larger data sets, you gotta be aware of this. If you start using this technique, it's gonna take time to generate those additional samples to fill in the gaps in that data to address it. So when you do this, it's gonna take longer. Now when we evaluate, um, we're gonna go back to the confusion matrix right here. And so if we look at it before and after, um, we can see here that predictive value um, is still pretty low uh, to predict the uh, values uh, appropriately, correctly. That's using the bagging techniques. Using boosting, it has essentially the same problem as the bagging. It's still pretty low. So there'll be some things that we'll want to continue to adjust inside of uh, our models and consider other ensemble uh, approaches for it. And so here, here's where we built out an ensemble model using that same stream. So right here, you can see we've got a couple different models that have been produced, putting those together into an ensemble. And we're using both the confidence weighted voting and the standard weighting voting. So by using this ensemble model, we're actually able to produce uh, something with a little bit better predictive value. So if we look here, now we're talking off of our training data set, 69% and our testing data set, you're talking, I'm sorry, 69% uh, and 68%. So you can see it is a marked improvement over where it's at, but there's still some areas which can be better, um, better tuned. And so here again, looking at our curves, you can see that it's getting closer to that type of a shape, which we wanna see. So the ensemble modeling here is producing better results. Now, when I do these as a side-by-side -side comparison, and this is a bit, uh, you know, unformatted, um, more of a quick and dirty type approach to this, here I've had multiple different kinds of models, and here I'm showing the accuracy. And so what I got out of this model here, the C5 model, I'm showing that using these techniques, I've been able to get it up to about a low 80% uh, if I'm looking at gain and lift. And so we're getting closer to really where it needs to be. Um, other models which I'm going to reject, you can see here uh, that it has more lower accuracy rates. And many of these are just kind of hovering in that 60% range as far as accuracy. So let's switch back over to uh, SPSS real quick and look through those individual streams. So here again, we talked about this. This type node has to be set to something so that it doesn't come through. Um, here I'm doing an SVM model, and this one's using a non-decision tree using a bagging example. 
and this one's using non-bagging. So I'm able to compare bagging versus non-bagging. Um, this one here is using boosting, so I'm able to compare boosting to non-boosting. And again, then they're using bagging to non-bagging. And so then from here, I can drill down. Depending on the model, you're going to get different results. But if you just take this one, for example, here we're going to see that our quality is starting to improve. Um, the actual value to the predictors, the predictor importance, is also starting to improve. It's not what I would call ideal, but we're getting very, very much closer by using some of these techniques. And here's another example. So if we look at our ensemble models, oh, I already had the, uh, the results in the uh, presentation for you. And here's the base evaluation one. Again, it's a, it's a bit of a mess, but I just wanted to put these side by side, all coming off of that partition data to then turn around and look and see which one is. And so out of these models which we've produced, this is the one that's the most interesting, the best, the cleanest one that we have. And so that produces a final model here where I've got a boosted, a non-boosted, and a uh, just a plain one that I put here together. And so that I'm able to kind of look at these and determine which of these is going to be the best for me. So that leads us into the final step for this week four, for week four is uh, to do any final initial uh, uh, additional evaluations, tuning to the final model, and prepare a new stream for the final package. And you should still continue to include your analysis document. Um, you should continue to in include any additional data and SPSS streams that you've done. Your model will look something like this. Uh, so it'll have a source data, It'll have your ETL data preparation stages with it. You'll take out anything that doesn't relate to the final model. So think of this as the exercise to, you're gonna produce the final model, you're gonna make it available out there, you're gonna push it out to production. That's what this model should look like. Um, have the golden nugget so you wouldn't have the little auto classifier, you wouldn't have manual nodes that are out there to build, just the, the nugget and then an output. Now that output can be Word, it can be Excel, it can be a flat file, doesn't matter. But the SPSS deployment stream should be very simple like this. Um, and then, uh, also you should also remember to remove your partition node at this point. Because we're done training the data, you've got a tuned model, it's ready to go. So now you'll just submit the final stream that'll just be, you take a raw data source, input data, whatever that is, and then there'll be output data and just the pieces that are relevant, the critical path that you'll have between A and B. In your analysis document, you'll have any final dis deployment instructions that will be specific to your model. And also, this is where you'll do the reflection on the results of your analysis. What did you learn? So if you've seen from our previous slides, the best we could do out of this data set was around 80% predictability for that promo code one. So um, it still leaves about 20% to chance. And so it's not the best model. It would not be um, the best tuned. Additional data could potentially benefit this type of a model. Um, that would be something that I'd want to mention as part of this. And just think about all those type of things, the reflections, the lessons learned, uh, what did you find out of your model? That would be all things that you'd put inside of this final piece. So um, that kind of covers beginning to end the three week block talking about classification um, modeling. Uh, the next three week block will be on behavioral segmentation and then we'll come back and we'll revisit these three these two uh, streams so you'll revisit your classification model and talk about some of the additional algorithms that you could put into place modifications and then talking again on the behavioral segmentation our final piece for the class is going to conclude with um, having the the uh, final capstone project where you'll build one of these uh, from from base zero your own data sets nothing that's been used in the course before all the way through the end of it. So as you're doing this, this is the practice. Uh, the first week is obviously, um, you know, a very raw model is expected. 
The next week, it's expected to be a little bit better. When you get to the deployment phase, it's expected to be considered production ready to go. And so it should be a final thing that you could run. It'll be relatively tuned to your data set that you have available, as well as any particular pieces of the analysis which you'd like to draw out, such as for the data size that you've got, um, additional data adding to this would, would improve upon it. So those are all things that you should consider as you turn in this final piece of the three weeks uh, that we're working on. As always, if you have any questions, uh, submit that back to the discussion forums. Um, if you've got any other questions too, you can also email me and I'll answer those. But again, thank you for your time. Um, we'll continue to have our collaborate sessions on Tuesdays. So feel free to join into those sessions or watch the replays. Have a good one. Thanks.